Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, and welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Nice to be back with you again. I hope you and yours are well. Uh, it's been another busy week um, in Scottish politics, and uh, we've got lots to talk about. Um, so let's, without further ado, bring in the, the panel. Um, starting there with the up and click manager, everyone's favourite lawyer, Eva. Hi, Eva. Hi, Roddy. How are you doing? There have been some good laughs this week. I think one of the nicest was in relation to the monkey who made a break for freedom. And I think mm. the whole of Scotland on social media was behind him, looking at all these cartoons of him being chased by the police and then eventually handcuffed and taken back into captivity. So, yeah. who do we so, but hopefully he'll be fine. But it was yeah. it was nice to see him for a wee while and wonder where he was on his travels. Uh, maybe he'll get out again. <laughs> um, maybe other people who get into prison might not get out of their cells. But that's another story for another day. And over there in Old Ricky, we've got our weatherman, Mr Quinnan. Free the macaque, that's what I say. Uh -huh. Yeah, free the macaques. How are you? I'm very well. And it has Good, been excellent. A, a week of laughs. <laughs> yeah, we need them. And down there on the borders, very one. Yeah, I was hoping the macaque monkey would come down here and then I would give him a safe place to hide. So I'm really disappointed. But at one point, there was a rumour going round that it might be Pete Morell in disguise because yeah. he's gone yeah. a all as well. well no doubt also. It. That was a good segue. You just took what, the legs away from me. That's what I was going to say that. We've been three weeks in to the who, Where's Pete Morell? And we've only had one person sending us in a photograph, and it's a good friend of the show, Mr. Lukewarm Dave. Could you put that picture up, Techie? That you see... Now, while we, we love Lukewarm Dave, and we don't think this may, we just have some suspicions that this might not be a genuine picture. But um, So no pen for uh, Lukewarm Dave. But remember, folks, the first person that gets us a photograph of Mr. Morell, um, we will send you a nice you know, Scottish prison pen. What more could you ask for? Um, he certainly wasn't, uh, he wasn't at the COVID inquiry supporting his wife, but we'll come on to that later. But I'd like to start with our, um, our main story of the, the week for me. Um, was uh, went on at Hollywood, and it was where Ash Reagan, after the, the support from the FNP at Westminster on the self-determination bill, we thought we'd repeat this and we could take the power into Hollywood um, and we could get moving on independence. Now, here's... Ash Reagan asking the question of the, believe it or not, this guy is the Independence Cabinet Secretary, make you laugh, um, and you'll hear his reply. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, as part of its work to further the case for Scottish independence, what its position is on whether it could hold a referendum on the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Minister Jamie Hepburn. This Parliament has a clear mandate to hold a referendum on independence from the last election. Last year, this Parliament passed a motion calling on the UK Government to respect the right of people in Scotland to choose their constitutional future. The UK Government should respect both the 2021 election result and the position of this Parliament. At this stage, we have no plans to hold any other referendum on the powers of the Scottish Parliament. He should have just stopped, Eva, at we have no plans. It would be a lot easier. Because they have no plans. It's very difficult to remain civil and respectful towards somebody who has such a high position in the country and yet at every possible turn makes such a fool of himself. And he's doing that because the can continuity candidate requires him so to do. Um, you've alluded before, Roddy, to me having appeared on the TNT show a few weeks ago and at that stage, I was interviewed solo and I laid down a challenge to Jamie Hepburn, who was on the following week. Um, the host, John Drummond, agreed to put some questions to him and the programme agreed to look at the possibility of Jamie and I going head to head. I don't think that would be very fair now in the context of what we've seen in the last couple of weeks. 
because if ever somebody deserved to have the floor wiped with them, it's Jamie Hepburn. And it would give me, unfortunately, the greatest of pleasure tinged with the greatest of sadness to have to do so and to have to point out the error of his ways. We've seen his colleagues in Westminster, albeit belatedly at the last minute, support Neil Hanvey's self-determination bill. There is no reason, none, why the SNP and also the Greens within the Scottish Parliament don't support Ash Reagan's bill to bring the opportunity to the people of Scotland to vote for the prospect of being entitled to have a referendum on independence. The fact that the SNP are running away from this confirms only that they have no plans other than to see themselves re-elected where they are putting party before country yet again. 2015, 56 out of 59 MPs in Westminster were SNP. That, though, was described by Nicola Sturgeon as not being a vote for independence. It ought to have been. Between then and now, there's been innumerable other mandates. And the hard, horrible fact is that as far as Westminster's concerned, Scottish voices are meaningless. And if there is a number of SNP MPs returned to Westminster at this general election, there is no doubt that they will be far fewer in number than currently sit there. So if they couldn't persuade Westminster to grant a referendum when they'd 40 odd MPs, there is no chance that they're going to persuade them to grant a referendum when they've many, many fewer than that. So mm -hmm. this was more hot air. It was a staged debate in the context of independence in Europe. It meant nothing. They were wheeling out the independence card with no substance behind them. Actually, not unlike the Wizard of Oz, when the curtains pulled aside, there's nothing left but hot air. Absolutely. Lloyd, you would think after the, the mistake or misstep, I'll do the bit, give her the benefit of the doubt of the Supreme Court and getting, you know, sent away with a flea in the rear. With every poll for the last 12 months showing the independence is the settled will of the Scottish people. More 50% or more every poll for the last 12 months. Yet the SNP is slipping. Here was their opportunity to get back into favour with the, the, the yes vote that's not supporting them. And they blew that chance. It's like missing an open goal. The the whole thing was 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 deeply, deeply depressing. I never thought that at some stage the leader or one of the, the, the leading figures of the Scottish National Party would stand up in the Scottish Parliament and effectively say to another member of the Parliament for a party that totally supports independence, it's our ball and we are going home. That was effectively what he said. It was, uh, oh, it's you. We don't listen to you. It was entirely juvenile, his response, and not what we should be seeing from ministers of our government never mind ministers of the supposedly pro-independence party. This again shows us that underlying all of this, and it's something we've spoken a lot about, and it's time for the SNP to come clean, the studied ignoring of the question by all the SNP members on the benches and the shuffling of papers by Angus Robertson exemplifies entirely the failed thinking. These people internally are saying independence is not possible, independence can't be done, but if we tell the party then we are finished so we better not say it. But they're carrying out every single action that tells us that they think devolution is the best that we can get. And that is not the purpose nor the function of anyone who is elected as a Scottish National Party member of the Scottish Parliament or indeed the Westminster Parliament. In actual fact, even talking about it is depressing me, Roddy. It's, I genuinely never believed I would ever see an independent supporting minister effectively attack an independent supporting member of the Parliament on the central issue that binds us all. And does Jamie Hepburn not understand this? You can disagree with people about everything else, but when we agree on independence, then those people are your comrades. Those people are your fellow travellers. Those people are the ones you support, not denigrate. Mm. Meanwhile, uh, Yvonne, two things. Uh, we've, got, we've had uh, Umza writing to 
Peter Starmer want to do a deal with him, but what I'm talking to him, and if Sarah want to do a deal with him, Ash Reagan even said to the SNP, look, if it's because it's me, because it's Albert, you take the bill, you run with it, you make it your bill, and still they said no. You owe me a pound. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so they, they've just got absolutely no self-awareness at all. And they have they showed that today when they um, held a press conference and unveiled their 10th independence paper. This one was uh, on culture. Um, and even the even the media are now uh, losing total respect for them. You know, they've just they the journalists there reminded Angus Robertson. Did you know today was the anniversary of the film Groundhog Day? As though, oh, here we go again. We're here again. And you know, when you get the media publicly making jokes at your expense um that just isn't a good look and angus robertson had a face like a smacked ass to put it bluntly when uh, he was reminded this is the anniversary of groundhog day um 33 years ago i think it was so uh, mm. sorry i'm rehearsing for my nicholas sturgeon pca tears <laughs> so um anyway the yeah, they, they've just, they've lost the plot. They've got Ash Reagan, their greatest asset in Holyrood today. Um, and I'm proud to say she's part of the Alipa party, of, you know, one of the many amazing women we've got. And uh, she's offering them every way Um you know, Eva's great uh, video that's gone viral talks about Scotland United being the answer. And there is Ash Reagan. You know, it's like pantomime. You feel like shouting, she's behind you with the answers. And they're carrying on blithely. And, and that independence minister um, is just pathetic. And I'll, I'll leave that thought there because um, I'm very conscious we've got probably children watching the show as well. So um, It's not you know. stopped you before. I know, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just worried that uh, you're going to get um, complaints from YouTube or whoever's pulling the strings on the social media these days. Mm. Well, then, you know, the other thing, I prefer to think it's uh, when you look at Ash Reagan, you, you think you should be turning around to all the SNP members and say, it's like bullseye, here's what you could have won. You know, instead you've got Mr. Continuity, um, who keeps slipping in banana skins that are not even there. But on the question of that, there's a lot of frustration out there, Eva. The grassroots are getting more and more disenchanted, not just with the SNPs, as I've highlighted. This last poll that was out last week, commissioned by, on behalf of Alpha, I believe, um, but it was at 52% for independence, and that is in running with all of them. And we know the SNP votes anywhere between 35, 38, 39%. That's running through it like a piece of Blackpool rock. And yet, there seems no desire to move forward. So the grassroots are getting a wee bit upset, fed up, and they get think, you know, they're moving into other groups and other organisations because they're losing faith. And one of those, and it's a wee plug for my, my blog site here, but I had a blog this week written by Leanne Tervet. Um, and their folks are advised to go and see it, and it's called Schemes for Indy. Um, and uh, I know you would have read it, like uh, everyone else here, and a lot of other people. It was very well uh, received. But basically, um, Eva, the, the grassroots are starting to decide we're not waiting, we're going our own way. My understanding is that Leanne's plan, which has been very well received throughout the whole country, um, is that there be activists um, 
on the doors and on the streets and on stalls in every scheme in every town and city throughout Scotland with a view to ensuring that everybody gets on the voters' roll, get folks signed up to vote, get them photo ID available for the vote. And the reason for that is that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that those who have the most to gain from independence in Scotland are those who live in schemes. Now, that's not meant to be in the slightest pejorative. It's the reality. The greatest driver of poverty in Scotland is inequality. And you'll see from Leanne's blog her very firmly held belief, with which I agree, and I think most right-minded people do, is that if you're born into poverty in Scotland, it is very difficult, if not for some, impossible to get out of that. And it's something that politicians over decades have struggled to address. Um, I know that Alex Salmond addressed this substantially whilst he was First Minister and able so to do. But steps towards eradicating poverty within the current and the previous SNP administration have been very poor. Governments have tended not to take advice from experts and they've not targeted the right areas as much and as hard as they should have done. But it doesn't matter what you ever do under devolution. It's not devo that people want. It's indie revo, independence revolution. And that will happen when everybody in the schemes is motivated to vote. They have to be given hope and understanding that you exercise your franchise and you elect the people who represent your interests and your views. And if you think that the politicians currently elected or standing in the wings don't do that, then you should ensure doubly that you not only get yourself registered, but you chat the house next door and make sure they're on the voters roll as well and you make sure that the politicians that you elect have your values where they talk about decent housing a national house building corporation a national energy company where we don't have pensioners or single working poor worrying between heating and eating all the things that we talk about all the time where we have a decent nhs where ambulances are available on time where doctors are available, where nurses are not having to work shifts and bank nurses because they've got decent full-time permanent positions, where we can say the rocks will melt in the sun before we'll ever have tuition fees, where you don't have to sit on an oil rig or a wind turbine in the North Sea and look ashore to food banks and baby banks and all the rest of it. And that will come when the ordinary people of Scotland, of whom I am one, and I'm proud to say I'm one, are able to vote for the people that they think represent their views and their interests because I'm damn sure that most of those, not them all, but most of those sitting in Holyrood at the moment and those that Scotland elects to Westminster do not share those views and those values. And if they ever had the motivation to make Scotland an independent country and a better place for all, that motivation has got lost somewhere. Maybe it's down the back of the couch and they can pick it up next week. But when Schemes for Indy really takes off, which it is beginning to do, then politicians are going to have to take notice because those who have not fulfilled their remit to their people will be out on their ear when the people are mobilised. Indeed. And that was the thing in 2014, Lloyd. I mean, we just heard Jimmy, Jimmy Hepburn said, we have no plans, and that's a disgrace. Um, but it was in 2014, the Yes Movement, um, started and it took over and the politicians were chasing the yes movement. They, they set the pace. This could happen again. I think it needs to happen again. I can understand why the people are getting fed up with the politicians. Well, they're too busy playing at party politics um, and all that, the, the shenanigans that go on inside political parties. Um, the, the, the grassroots have lost patience. I think it's a great move. Do you? I think it's fantastic and I think Leanne deserves all credit, not just for the proposal, but her analysis, which goes back to 2014. As somebody who was part of the the Yes movement and that mobilisation of, of working people, and particularly the mobilisation of people who were living in our, in our housing schemes, you know, the beginning of 2014 was about getting people registered in these areas because so many had dropped off the electoral register and this time round or at the next election we can't have those people's voices ignored they have to be the only thing i've heard of criticism of it and it only comes from the political class is this what who do you tell the people to vote for when you knock on their door well hold on it's not up to us 
to tell people who to vote for. Okay. Our job is to motivate people on the basis of exercising their democratic right, understanding the power that independence will bring to those very disenfranchised people and let them make up their mind about which particular party will deliver. And if you operate it from that basis, then the parties will have to respond to what the people are saying. So hopefully, once we get this up and running, if, it, if it's a mirror of my experience in Nidri, Craig Miller, Magdalene and Bingham in 2014, then when the parties come to knock on the door to ask for your vote, the people will have questions for the parties. The people will have demands of the parties. And that's what currently the Scottish National Party very specifically needs to hear. It needs to have a door opened in their face and not simply allow them to ask who you're voting for. We need people saying, this is what you better do for me if I vote for you. And only when you tell me you're going to do these things will I get off my backside and go to the polling station and mark my cross. That is people power. And what Leanne understands and understands very specifically is this is the way to burgeon that, that people power and more importantly, give it a focus. Absolutely. Here, But just as a side issue, um, one of your friends from Craig Miller who tells me the street stall keeps going even to this day that was started back in the in the day. And it's good to know we need to get that motivation going. Um, one of the other things, uh, Yvonne, that the Tories have brought in this, you've got to have ident identification when you come to vote. But the way Leanne's talking about it is when you're registered with postal votes, you're not requiring to have photo ID. So it's another way that the disenfranchised um, can be enfranchised, if you like. You're on mute again. Lie. Right. I mean, it, it's true. And it's not just um, the schemes that are left wanting. Uh, there's the Muslim communities as well who have been disenfranchised. And the Islamophobia out there is so palpable. It's turning and it, it's almost official now. Tory policy. Uh, to to have a downer on the Muslim community, but what's happening in uh, is uh, an organisation called TMV, and they're doing this. Um, it's called uh, TMV, the Muslim Vote, and what they're doing is uh, getting into communities, swapping strategies and tactics of uh, of what uh, can be. Done, and they're coordinating communities to get a database and they've already identified 50 constituencies in England alone where the, the Muslim vote, if it goes one way or another, can actually change the sitting MP. And, of course, you can target all, all, all the MPs that you want the ones who voted for genocide, the ones who refused to vote for ceasefire. And what they're saying to those people who don't have anybody to vote for because Labour, Tories, you know, the, the policies have been horrendous. Um, they're saying, write on your ballot paper what you think or a message that you want to get to your uh, particular politician because. Mm -hmm. uh, Every spoiled ballot paper is examined by the powers that be, by the future MP. And if you get thousands of spoiled ballot papers coming in, you're still exercising your democratic right of how you feel about um, the establishment, the voting system, uh, being excluded because you're told we, we're not interested in your vote because you're a Muslim or you come from a scheme or whatever the reason is. And um, people are starting to mobilise. There's a There is a sort of revolution in the air now because, as I've said previously, you know, democracy is an illusion and people are waking up to the fact that... Um, you know, they're being told you've got to vote and then they're thinking, well, what the hell am I voting for? You know, yeah. the, the 
frying pan of the fire, the rock of the hard place. And uh, in, but instead of turning off voters, getting them out to vote is one of the best ways of paying back the establishment. Well, good. I hope, in... I hope you're right. I hope you're right. For example, in the Alpha Party, Mr. Majid there, he'll be out signing people up. I hear he's very good at that. And on, on yeah, that, he is. Uh, uh, that's what we want. Oh, I'm just, my pen's just gone. Um, but you're right, um, because that's the other thing, Eva, that it can be doing, is, you know, those who have no plans, those who believe in, you know, things that you don't believe in, like gender ideology, or don't want to move things along, you can go to the, the polling station, right, none of the above, even if there's not one of the candidates there that you want to vote for, for the particular party, you can still make your voice heard. I wouldn't currently advocate that, um, but that's because I'm still holding out hope for a general election that can be some sort of independence promoting platform. But I can well understand people's frustration. Um, one of the issues that really troubles me is this electoral reform bill that's been published within the last few days. Yep, can you stick that up, Techie, while he was talking about it? It causes me once more to question the priorities of the Scottish Government because the electoral reform that I want to see, as we all do, is constitutional reform where we go to the polls to elect our independent government, our parliament that will run the country, that will be free, where we will have self-determination. The difficulty with this new legislation about electoral reform is that people who are foreign nationals that are living in Scotland on a time-limited basis, will be able to be candidates in Scottish elections. I can't understand why that should be so. But that's one of very many different issues that are raised in this bill. One of the problems with the bill too is there will be powers to prevent people from being candidates. Um, if passed, the legislation would ban people from being MSPs if convicted of intimidating campaigners and electoral mm. workers. Now, generally, you would think that's a pretty bland statement that everybody would agree with until you remember that we're about to be living in Scotland that has become the land of Hamza Yousaf's Hate Crime Act, where the police don't know how to implement the legislation and you'll be guilty of hate crime for lots of different reasons, which normal people don't think is criminal and can include events that occur within your home. <coughs> I don't, for the life of me, understand why this legislation has come before the Parliament at a point in time when people are hungry, cold, skint, worrying about the future, and we have at least a 52% majority for independence because all efforts of the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government should be focused on how best to attain independence. And rather than drafting legislation, which seems at the moment pretty pointless, if not counterproductive, what Hamza and those around him should be doing is simply creating the constitutional convention that we were promised on the 31st of January 2020 by the continuity candidate's predecessor. There's no good reason why we don't have that. That would be a far more worthwhile exercise than producing, as he did today, the 10th in a row of independence papers, which Hamza Yusuf himself has said nobody reads. He's wrong, because I've read them all. Um, and it is a matter of regret that I have, but there's nothing there that we don't already know. There's your um, yeah, issue there is. in relation to the electoral, I think it's electoral reform and reformation yeah. bill. Yeah, um, the Scottish Elections Representation and Reform Bill. Aye. Pretty troubling, pretty concerning that foreign nationals will be able to become MSPs here even although they're here on a time-limited basis. Yeah. I'm not aware that any other country in the world allows that and I can't understand why Scotland would mm -hmm. unless there are perhaps people here who are friends of the SNP that are foreign nationals living here on a time-limited basis and who fancy a seat in Holyrood. What other explanation could there be? Well, I don't know. All the research tells us the people who were here in part-time contracts or soldiers on uh, secondment from south of the border or whatever, 
Well, the ones that voted no, they were given the vote because it was the local authority um, uh, franchise they used. So uh, these are people who are opposed to Scottish self-determination. Why would a Scottish Independence Party, Lloyd, bring in a bill like that, which would give that very demographic um, the chance to get the representation in our parliament? That's another example of uh, the fear that was created in uh, the British establishment and part of the British establishment is the British Civil Service, which is the civil service of the Scottish Government. The fear created in 2014 on uh, what I believe wasn't the correct franchise then uh, mm -hmm. is deliberately being manipulated to make sure that we don't get as close as we did in 2014 or indeed exceed the, uh, the, the, the result in 2014 and, and become an independent country. This is legislation which has been thought up by the civil servants probably the chief civil servant who's an, who's an appointee effectively of uh, the Westminster government and it, it says to me because the only defense I've heard from senior SNP people about this is oh it wouldn't won't it be great we'll be such a welcoming country people will come here and know that we offer them all you know a, a full franchise the right to take part in the democratic process it's virtue signaling but it's virtue signaling in completely and utterly the wrong direction. And again, a phrase I use practically weekly shows the paucity of intellect at the top of the party. When that was put in front of them, of certainly the constitution minister, admittedly not a particularly bright individual, uh, he should have seen right away that this was an attempt to gerrymander the franchise. That's what's going on here. But they have bought the story that this is about them being nice and cuddly to people that come from all over the world. Well, I would just say to people, let's have a look at some of the people who were able to become elected to the Scottish Parliament who are foreign nationals, namely Lorna Slater, the circularity minister who's using millions of our pounds on a practically weekly basis, Maggie Chapman from Zimbabwe, who is the main flag carrier for the, the insane anti-science GRRB. Now, if that's what we want, if we want notional concepts that are not a product directly of our culture and our people, then, then you go along with this. But if you want independence and you want a truly democratic country that has respect for itself and seeks respect in the world, then you operate on the basis of a franchise which is rooted absolutely rooted in the people who have lived here in it for at least in my belief 10 years an absolute minimum of 10 years i would prefer 20. that is the simple straightforward fact that other countries in europe use they would never no other country in europe would operate in a franchise on this basis because as eva inadvertently pointed out for us in the independence movement all it would take in the run-up to an independence election or an independence referendum is for the British to transfer all their naval, air force and military forces to barracks in Scotland for the duration of that time, thereby allowing any of our positive democratic steps forward to be halted and right there in their steps. It's, it's an absolute disgrace. Yeah, I mean, for example... Yvonne, I've been living now in Catalonia since 2016. I have never had a vote for a general election here. Um, I, I got a vote for the EU, obviously, but that's no longer. Um, I only get to vote in local elections. I have no problem with that, none whatsoever. I would think it ridiculous if I was to be given a vote to decide the future of Catalonia, whether it be in or outside of Spain, whether I should get to choose the government. I've come here to enjoy the life. Why should I get to tell other people in this country whose country it is that it's a, this is how it should be the way I want as an outsider? Well, speaking as somebody who was born on the wrong side of the border, I wouldn't have any objections if I was told to wait 10 years. I disagree with mm -hmm. Lloyd on 20 years. That's, for me, a bit, uh, a bit too long. But in the wrong hands, it is virtue signalling, but in the wrong hands, this can fuel xenophobia, it can fuel racism, uh, problems that we have in Scotland and that we, we need to tackle head on. Um, and in the, the, this legislation will not help at all. In fact, it'll 
create more of an othering of uh, people, more distrust and uh, questions of loyalty. And Scotland is, can well do without that. But I, I think, you know, as I say, speaking as, um, I don't like to describe myself as an English person. I'm a Geordie. Speaking as a Geordie, um, I can see that there are lots of very good reasons to be invested in the country that you're living in for at least mm -hmm. 10 years. I mean, I'm living in, in the belly of the beast down here in the borders. And um, I listen to some of the English here and I'm just thinking, you know, they've been sent up by the Tories. Some of the ideas that they've got and um, you, you can't, sh sh you know, move them on their position. And it is enemy territory down here. I don't know why Kate Forbes came up there. I think one of our techies hit the wrong button at the wrong time. We'll come back to that one. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I, I, I come under a lot of pressure from a lot of people. I was one of the first, I think, to come out and say that the franchise that we used in 2014 was wrong and it wasn't the right one to use. But, oh, but Alex, I said, I don't care about Alex. I'm going to say I disagree with him as well. I, I think it was wrong and I think we could make our own franchise a proper. I agree, 10 years, anyone who's been here, paid their taxes, moved in, bought a house, my problem is with, as I say, is e.g. soldiers on secondment, people working on a contract, fixing our uh, mobile towers or working in the rigs or working up in Aberdeen or working up in a short-term contract, being allowed to vote or students from overseas who then leave and leave us to pick up their, what they've done with their voting. That's what I was opposed to. And I still am, whatever our franchise is. But... So we're not going to get a referendum because there are no plans. We don't need to worry about these things. But meanwhile, not only were the, the SNP saying um, they had no plans uh, either, there is a... The Tunza had a meeting with the mayor of the city of London, not Sadi Khan, London City. There you go. There he is with the mayor of London, the city of London. That man's got more power than the prime minister, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen. And he was signing an agreement to show, to get closer connections between the city of London, in short, spins, um, the people who have uh, taken all your utilities, sold them, made money, the people have made money out of COVID, the people have made money out of them. He wants closer ties with them. Um, that's not what an independence party do. You want to get away from the imperial power, surely, not make closer ties with them. Absolutely. Now, I like to be accurate about these things and not do anybody a disservice. So here's some expressions. Scotland's First Minister will visit the City of London this week as a framework to promote financial services is agreed. The deal, the deal between Scotland and the City of London will see opportunities identified to align messaging and develop a coordinated approach. Scotland's going to be coordinated with the City of London. Yep. To promote financial services in the UK, whilst also promoting the push for green financing. Any alarm bells ringing yet? During his visit to London, Hamza Youssef will meet Lord Mayor of London, Michael Minelli, will attend a belated burn supper and will participate in a round table with ambassadors from the 27 countries of the EU. What's missing there is the word independent because the ambassadors that he met are ambassadors from countries which are independent. He was the only one who was there representing a parish council because that is just about all that Holyrood is in the eyes of the Lord Mayor of the City of London. If there was ever an advert that showed you how determined Hamza Youssef is to remain at the head of a devolved assembly, then you've got it there in that, that one swoop, that one image, sitting there smiling, signing some sort of uncle cordial where the financiers or those who are responsible for the financiers who are happy to continue to bleed Scotland dry, remove Scotland's money and resources and continue to build wealth within the city of London for those who live there, for those who work there, and for those who take their money from there and invest it abroad. 
not to the benefit of the people of Scotland, but very much to their own benefit. That is the last place Hamza should have been, and it is the last contract or entente that he should ever have been completing. It is an utter disgrace and a sellout. We'll get another sellout. Just before I ask you, Lloyd, to go on, just a couple of things I should say. That the city of London, the square mile, is actually not a part of the United Kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you know that. And His Majesty the King cannot go into that square mile without the permission of the Lord Mayor. Again, I don't know how many of you know that. And the last thing, I'm sure you know, Lloyd, there's a person called the Reminder who sits behind the Speaker in the House of Commons. And if he hears anything that he thinks will be detrimental to the city of London, the square mile, he is allowed and has the power to intervene and tell the Speaker to stop whatever it is that's happening. It's quite frightening that UMSA is treating with them, is it not, Lloyd? I think what you just outlined, Roddy, probably would be would com be complete news to Hamza Yusuf, <laughs> uh, as it is news to many many people. But particularly, you know, the current cohort of politicians appear to operate on the basis of uh, what they read in the paper this morning. They don't really seem to spend much time searching out and doing the research on, that they need to do before they they, they say stupid things. And frankly, Hamza's done it again, not only said stupid things, but signed stupid things. The, 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 the horror here for me is we appear to be run by politicians who are impressed. They're impressed by other people's titles. They're impressed by where other people come from, be it America, the European Union, or indeed the mayor of London. You know, maybe he thought he was meeting Dick Whittington. I don't know. But uh, I'm sure he found that while he was there, the streets are not paved with gold, but they're paved using stone from our country and money from our oil fields taken directly from our people. It's Hamza Yusuf's job to go there and take back, not to make deals with about what we do in the future. The fact of the matter is the City of London owes this country an enormous amount of money. It owes the people of this country for its fiscal incompetence an apology at least, if not reparations, once we become an independent country. That should have been in the forefront of the mind of an SNP First Minister. Unfortunately, it was not. No, terrible. Yvonne, could you believe that he would go down and you know, talk to these people and try and pull us closer into the city of London? No, it, it's, uh, I mean, he, he looks very cosy there, doesn't he, sitting between yeah. two pieces of gammon, um, <laughs> which is, I think that uh, this will have consequences for the crazy Freeport scheme. And I think that mm -hmm. um, in the next few weeks, we'll see some really uncomfortable legislation coming out to do with Freeport's. And, uh, of course, with everything, the Tories do not give us presents to benefit Scotland. They plant things to come along later on and collect the, uh, the riches from the seeds that they've planted. And, you know, it, going to the, the streets of London paved with gold, the streets of London are paved with Scottish gold, and Humza has as much credibility as Dick Whittington's cat. You know, really, um, he's, he's a mug. And he's oh. going to make mugs out of us all. Nothing good ever came out of London. Now, well, that's, this is the thing that gets me, folks. So I'm going to move on. But, you know, Grangemouth, our media have been silent virtually. They've said nothing. And about this... Our media were silent. We've not been silent on here and we never will be when there's anything that's detrimental to the people of Scotland and the nation of Scotland. And that, what whom's they got up to, was detrimental. They're trying to say, oh, they're going to bring back the Scottish Stock Exchange. No, they're not. No, they're not. They removed that as soon as they found the oil. They're not going to bring it back. They're looking at other ways to spin us. Or Lloyd's right, the free ports. That's where they're going to come in and absolutely roger us. So beware. And if you get a chance, make your complaint. But I want to move on. I'm going to give you a wee clue. I'm going to, I would like to talk about Nicola. Oh, 
Oh, really, why? Um, did you, were you impressed, Eva? What a what's going I was actually really upset because I don't like to kick somebody when they're already down, and quite clearly Nicola Sturgeon is down. I don't know who her tears were for. I don't know if they were for herself because she was repeatedly caught out or if they were genuine tears for those who had suffered so very much and who continue to suffer. Everybody in the world suffered during the pandemic. But what we expected was that those who led us would be honest. And I think that as a, as a people in Scotland particularly, if we think that our those who govern us have made mistakes that are genuine mistakes, but that they were well motivated to look after the people of the country, we can be forgiving. Because none of us would have wanted to have been in the position that the First Minister was in. The problem that we've got is when you assess the available evidence, there are serious concerns. And there's evidence that is not available to be assessed. So there are obvious difficulties there. And there become different theories as to why some messages that were promised weren't delivered and why some records that ought to have been kept were not kept, or those records that are available are not as comprehensive as we would have liked. And yes, it was pandemonium in the early days, but the blame for that pandemonium in large part lies fairly and squarely at the feet of the Scottish Government, because it was their job to protect the people of the country. A pandemic like this, of course, happens once in a century. Prior to this, the biggest one that we spoke about was the flu epidemic of, was it 1918? Uh, 19, yep. Now, we were told on a daily basis by Nicola Sturgeon what the statistics were, what she was doing, why she was doing certain things, why there, would, there wouldn't be lockdown, what the figures were. And what we found is that we were often not told the truth. And it seems like there were some circumstances where decisions were being made by a couple of people who were obviously the First Minister and her special advisor. It looks like there were instances where reasonable evidence from scientists was not being properly interpreted or implemented. It looks like we had the wool pulled over our eyes on innumerable occasions, and it's appalling that there were many meetings that are completely unrecorded, especially those which are described as the gold standard. Now, I'm required by the Law Society to maintain comprehensive files. It is a failing in my profession if I don't have a file that shows my dealings with a client or with the opposite number or at court, and I'm supposed to record events as they develop and keep records so that anybody looking at that file, if I drop down dead tomorrow, can read the file and can see from day one what I did and why I did it, and what different stages in the processes were, and how events unfolded. If that applies to me as a lawyer, and it applies equally well to medical professionals, it applies pretty well in any job that you keep records showing what you did and why you did it, partly for self-preservation, but also so that people coming after you know what you've done, and they can tidy up as required. If it applies to all of us, then all the more so ought it to apply to those who govern us in the midst of a very serious health crisis. So the missing records is an issue. Nicola Sturgeon promised that everything would be handed over. She hasn't done that. That on its own is a terrible failing. Before we get into the realms of poor possibly misleading explanations in respect of transfers from hospitals to care homes. Many of us, including people here, and I include myself there, were involved in big decisions in the years of lockdown to do with very vulnerable people. So there's a lot of answers needed to be given to questions that have been asked and not appropriately answered and questions that have still to be asked. So the best thing that can happen is we actually have complete transparency and honesty and the authorities enable there to be obtained directly from the servers all of the missing messages and then there'll be no mystery anymore we won't have to speculate we won't have to guess nobody will have to worry 
will have a complete picture once the servers have been downloaded and provided comprehensive information. Indeed. Well, I will say, and I observed, when Nicola Sturgeon teared up, it wasn't when she was talking about all the deaths, it was when she was getting asked about her particular behaviours or something she had done. That's when she teared up. It wasn't over that. But one of the other thing, it came out about Gold Command, Lloyd, and this Gold Command that she, uh, that Nicholas Sturgeon ran, the, the Gold Command meetings, but she didn't have her finance secretary. Now, the finance, cabinet secretary for finance should have been there because there was that was one of the big things, furloughs, payments, etc. You would think that they would have been involved. A lot of the times, in fact, most of them, Gene Freeman, the health secretary, wasn't involved in gold commands. That, that's a strange way to act, is it not? Yes, it is. And uh, you know, in some ways, if we if we if we focus on the 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 woman of yesterday, you know, Nicola's over. It's done. Uh, you know, but if there is to be any payback for her, then it's it's out of our hands. Let it happen. Let it emerge. But uh, frankly, I'm not interested in in and talking about Nicola in that first minister's role, other than she played fast and loose with structures, and Eva's alluded to it. It you cannot operate in the middle of a crisis like this with flexible staff. You cannot operate in a crisis like this by excluding people. I mean, I I, I look at the whole structure of it, and I I see you know. Jason Leach, the dentist, is uh, suddenly the, 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 the chief medical officer. Uh, Debbie Serdar, who's an academic with a degree in anthropology, was one of Nicola Sturgeon's closest advisors on something that she frankly knows nothing about. Um, Liz Lloyd uh, and Nicola seem to be making all of the decisions. Now, as, as Eva said, if you don't minute these things, if you have secret groupings that develop names like Gold Command, but you don't have an absolute record of all the decisions that have been made, but you all get knocked down by a bus the following day. And these are things that responsible governments, responsible adults take into account in their business day and daily, in every business right across the world. But it's even more important when you're in the business of governing a country in the middle of a crisis. You have to expect if you're all in a room breathing over each other and the disease is airborne, how do you know that those people aren't all going to end up in ventilators by the end of the day? And how then do you pass on to their substitutes the next day the decisions that have been made that day, the day before, the day before, and the day before that? Now, that's a symptom of a problem right at the heart of the civil service in Scotland because it's part of the British civil service. They operate a rotational basis so that nobody... Nobody becomes an expert in a field. So in real terms, our ministers who are not experts, be they, you know, any name anyone, you're not an expert when you come into the portfolio on day one, as Hamza told us in his, in his evidence that we saw in the WhatsApp messages. So what you require is people who carry the institutional memory, the people who carry the ideas and the decision-making processes on a day-to-day -day basis. Those people should not be getting shifted from one department to another department every three months, which is what is currently happening in this country. It, is, it, it does not make for good governance, but it also exposes the weakness in people. If nobody had turned, no one turned around during the entire COVID inquiry and said, is everything being minuted? Do you understand that if we all get this disease and we all have to go into hospital and the government grinds to halt, we don't have a manual to pass on to the people who will take over from us. It's, you know, it's really simple belt and braces stuff. And I think the greatest indictment of Nicola Sturgeon this week is the fact that she did not have the noose to put the structures in place for whatever reason, put the structures in place that given something had happened to her or the deputy or the chief medical officer that seamlessly the government could have proceeded. That, for me, was the greatest indictment. And here's the thing. You know, you've all heard me saying it often, Yvonne. I don't believe in coincidences, particularly in politics. Now, coincidentally, at the same time as all these messages were being wiped and we were in the middle of a pandemic, there was another WhatsApp group going on as well, the Vietnam group we know about. And it was at the time of Alex Salmon's 
Japan when it was all at its height. And we've heard certain snippets here and there. You know, and there was lots of stuff written in WhatsApp. Is it a coincidence that the WhatsApps were all getting cancelled at one time? Was it the COVID things they were trying to hide or was it something else? Worth a debate? No, I'm with you, uh, Roddy, on this. There's no such thing as coincidence. And um, one of Eva's qualities is that she's a kind person. I'm not. And uh, Nicola Sturgeon sat there, crocodile tears coming to her eyes. You know, I just look back to those early days when we were dealing with COVID. None of us, and I still don't know today what the hell COVID is and what its long-term consequences are. And we still have lots of answers uh, or lots of questions unanswered. She politicized that pandemic and she enjoyed doing it because she thought she could come out full of swagger ahead of Boris Johnson and it was a competition. And that's how she reacted. And she acted like the chief mummy telling us when we could go out, when we couldn't. And um, so... And, and then Janie Godley, the comedian, would come and do a voiceover and everybody would laugh and, and pat Nicola on the back. And, you know, she uh, was laughing at Boris Johnson uh, using a few Celtic words, which I don't blame her for. But um, to be running this uh, WhatsApp group and then deleting messages, and it, it, it just actually sounded as chaotic as the flaming Tories were now that um, the, the pandemic is hopefully over uh, and, and gone. Um, we're now starting to, to get the real stories about the Downing Street parties, the incompetence of Boris Johnson and the incompetence of Nicola Sturgeon. And I have to say, Lloyd touched on it last week, about the cockiness of uh, Liz, Liz Lloyd over um, the, the questions and the way that she answered uh, the questions about the WhatsApp groups and all of this. Nicola Sturgeon, by comparison, sat there and actually I did start to feel a little ounce of sympathy for her because she was like a rabbit trapped in the headlights. All her credibility and swagger had gone, and there was nowhere for her to run and nowhere for her to hide as she was forensically questioned. And this is just the start, because, you know, you mentioned um, Alex Salmond. Well, I would like to know what deleted WhatsApp messages will be resurrected for the Alex Salmond case when he gets his day in court. There's a lot coming down the pipeline and she knows it. And you could see the fear in her eyes because this is just the start. And um, if she's got any friends left in Holyrood, and I doubt that she has because she's casually thrown so many people under the bus, um, if you're still a friend, get her a big box of handkerchiefs because she's going to need it because of what is coming down the line. So, no, oh. I've got no sympathy for her at all. As far as I'm concerned, sympathy is that word in the dictionary between shit and syphilis when it comes to Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, well, she did refer to Boris Johnson. I quote Nicola Sturgeon here from one of the WhatsApps. We didn't get back. She called him a fucking clown. Which she is, but she still couldn't get us a referendum for independence. What does that tell you? Um, but on, on the theme, Eva, of um, uh, the coincidences, on the, a day that sticks in your mind as well as mine, the 31st of January 2020 was the day that Nicola Sturgeon stood in Edinburgh and told us all the promise she'd made the previous month at the UK general election about making sure we wouldn't be dragged out of the EU against our will was, in fact, going to happen. We were getting dragged out. She had promised us a referendum on independence. 
and she now cancelled it and said, you know, she would give us a constitutional convention, which never happened. But we've since heard from the COVID inquiry down south that on that same night, Boris Johnson spent eight grand in a party in number 10 Downing Street. Was that party, I suggest, was then celebrating that the money tree from Scotland was saved because Nicola Sturgeon had just betrayed her nation? It's not Brexit day. Mm. Uh, but what I was cynically considering was that as at the 31st of January 20, there were already fairly substantial reports coming from China about what was happening there with what we came to know as COVID-19. And I think at the end of January 20, it was probably abundantly clear, or should have been abundantly clear, to all sensible, high-ranking scientists and medics and politicians within the United Kingdom and the wider world that there was something pretty horrible going on and it might be heading our way. So I have slightly tended to the view that when the announcement of the Constitutional Convention was made, Nicola Sturgeon knew full well it was never going to be fulfilled for various reasons, not least the fact that there was likely to be a major health crisis that would likely militate against it. But if you put that to one side, the other cynical aspect is perhaps Boris was celebrating because he knew the Constitutional Convention was an empty promise because perhaps he'd already negotiated privately with Nicola Sturgeon to the effect that the answer to Scotland's prayers was actually going to become Devo Max and independence would remain on the back burner indefinitely, which in fact is what's happened. Um, it's certainly not something that there was ever any attempt by Nicola Sturgeon, any serious attempt to promote. If there had been a serious attempt to promote it, then the Constitutional Convention she announced that day would have been up and running the following week. So there are no coincidences in politics and you have to be cynical and you can look back and say, what was it that Nicola Sturgeon actually achieved? How kind to her will history be? Because she's not moved the dial in independence at all. She's not moved the dial in the context of prosperity for Scotland. In fact, things have got substantially worse. She concentrated on stopping Brexit when she'd no right to try to stop Brexit when a majority of the people of England voted for it. The way to stop Brexit for Scotland was to negotiate a deal not dissimilar to that that Northern Ireland were able to get and to drive forwards towards independence. But, you know, as we've said so many times before, she was a, a major letdown and unfortunately it looks like Hamza and his colleagues are going to be similarly disappointing. On that note, it, it's quite interesting if you have a look at the body language and the the, the faces of government ministers in Scotland nowadays because not one of them looks confident or happy. They all look on edge, they look nervous, they look tired, they struggle to maintain eye contact, they struggle to deliver a speech properly. Most of them, and I include Jamie Hepburn in this because he's one of the worst offenders, can barely string a couple of sentences together. They've got to stand there with a the speech and read it line for line, word for word. They don't believe what they're saying. They don't have the courage of their convictions. Somewhere along the lines, they've lost it. And unfortunately, Scotland needs somebody to take over and bring us back hope and inspiration because this, this dreary outlook has got to go. No, we're getting the clock's beating us, Lloyd. A couple of things I want to try and cram in. One of the things um, that maybe we need this inspiration, this kicking, maybe it is the Leanne Tervitz idea of uh, you know getting us back out campaigning. But the other one is, Tim Fain this week announced, you know, that the, the Northern Ireland Assembly has got um, reconvened um, and they have said openly that the United Ireland is within touching distance. And I believe it is. Um, and I believe that border poll will happen as soon as May, Mary Lou becomes a tear shock if she does. Well, that, could that be the inspiration for Scotland to get going again? I think it was one of the first programmes you asked me to do, Roddy. I, I, I think I made this, this suggestion that we should all prepare for that day and the possible domino effect. Um, I'm, 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 I'm cooling slightly on the, on the whole issue of, of, of what's going to happen. 
And the primary reason for that is not the statements from Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin have to say that because that's their raison d'etre. They, that's what keeps their people motivated out there and also there's very likely to be a general election in the in the Republic this year. But I want to have a real look at the deal that Donaldson has pulled off. Because I think in that first programme when I talked about the domino effect, I suggested that the SNP should be talking to Sinn Féin and the DUP about the negotiations that were going on with Westminster. Because I saw an opportunity there for us to get a little slice of that. We could have had the, cust the customs port, possibly at, at Stranraer, more likely at Cairn Ryan, and that would have helped us maintain our, our contact with Europe. But again, you know, a year's a long time, Roddy, and it is nearly a year. D would we want to be in the current European Union that seems to be getting told what to do by Miss van der Leiden? You know, do we want to be in part of a, a European Union that effectively is 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 walking in the in the footsteps of the United States with regard to the Ukraine and with regard to the, the the downtrodden people of Palestine? You know, it comes back to one of the central things about being a, a believer in independence is these choices are the choices. European Union, NATO, any international treaties whatsoever are the choice of our people after we're independent. They are not in the gift of our current elected politicians. And that's why I wish Mr. Youssef, other than on the issue of Gaza, would keep his mouth closed and don't do deals with the city of Westminster. Here, here. As I say, last word to you, my friend, Yvonne. Um, one good news that came out today about Scotland again, I've got to congratulate Humza. Well, America and Italy and Germany and France withdrew funding of UNRWA. Scotland, Ireland, Norway, Luxembourg, um, Belgium, Spain, good old Spain, they doubled or trebled their money on UNRWA. Um, and the Norwegian uh, Foreign Secretary said, you know, if you do that, if you take, withdraw your funding, you could be held liable and end up in the Hague yourself um, for uh, helping and assisting in a genocide. So I'm proud for Scotland that we keep paying, but it's good news that some countries are actually not towing, towing the, the American Israeli lobby. Belgium is one of those countries, and uh, it, it is continuing to fund the UN. Um, and just yesterday, Israel went and bombed one of the Belgian government uh, warehouses that is hmm. helping the people of Gaza. So the Belgians don't hang around. They summoned uh, the... Israeli ambassador into the office and I gather that he had his ass handed to him on a plate and was uh, told in no uncertain terms by Belgium that uh, they wouldn't tolerate this behaviour. And by the way, Israel um, said that there were a dozen or so uh, UN workers involved uh, in this uh, scandal which led to the defunding of um, UNRWA um, and now they're saying it's the rolled back to four and now it's emerging that the information that they got was extracted under torture of Palestinian prisoners and yet um, Westminster and the, several others in the EU and America, Canada, the usual suspects all ran up and said, right, we're withdrawing funding without actually asking for any evidence. No, they don't want evidence. Which is crazy. I mean, look at... Uh, UNRWA is about the same size as the Metropolitan Police Force. And uh, last year they had 150 police officers convicted, convicted of um, uh, crimes... 50 of them involving rape and sex crimes. And nobody said, right, that's it, let's defund the Metropolitan Police. You know, th this is, is absolutely crazy. The world leaders are under occupation, political occupation by Tel Aviv. But there is some good news because several servants across America, the UK and the European Union, 800 of them all together, have uh, appealed in a letter 
urging them to cease this unconditional support for the Zionist state and to Good. take all necessary action to facilitate the ceasefire. So that's good news. But, good. Well, um, we'll discuss that in know, greater depth in the midweek show. Time is against it as always. Yes. Right, a last couple of few uh -huh. things before we go. Um, on Friday night, folks, um, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Workers' Party, or the Labour Party, as you know it, sneaked into Scotland to do a 60 quid a head Burns night. Imagine him wanting to be in a Burns night um, to make money for in Jack McConnell's old constituency, I believe, um, and sneak back out again. Because it, it's incredible that a Labour leader in Scotland, red plate side area, has to sneak in and out because they're so unwelcome. One last thing, Techie, can you stick up All Under One Banner's March, the first one of the, the year, which is on the 4th of May, ladies and gentlemen, in Glasgow. Please start, put that in your diaries. It's just come out that the business in Scotland have decided to one a couple of weeks before that uh, in Glasgow, which I find, I don't know why they've done that. I didn't know, don't know why they can't talk to All Under One Banner, make it a joint, and they can get under the one banner like the rest of us. But business in Scotland... Um, have different motivations than most of us. Okay, folks, we've run out of time. Um, we have to go. Thank you once again. I should say for you, ladies and gentlemen, the reason our Phil's not here is a rather um, last-minute arranged important business meeting over there in the US of A, and we had hoped that he might have arrived, but obviously it's going on longer than anticipated. But he will be back with us hopefully next week, as will my three wonderful guests here, and I hope you will be too. If you haven't already liked the show, make sure you do. If you haven't subscribed, please do and share it wherever you can. And until we see you, please please you and yours. Take care. Through a Scottish prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.